Welcome to the Revelation series, part 56. We're going to end off the 18th chapter this evening. So where we are in the book is the seven-year tribulation is over. That was the 16th chapter. The second coming of Jesus has arrived to wipe out all unbelievers because this can't go on forever, right? The, the world is not long for this world. So, and not because of what God has done, but because what, what we have done. Boy, listening to the news about, about the, uh, the climate crisis. Uh, like we, have, we have wrecked this planet. We've absolutely wrecked it. And all of the promises from the Paris Accord, if you're familiar with that, where all the countries got together and said, this is how we're going to contribute to, to keeping the climate crisis at bay. And, uh, and no one has a, a review of that. This is years later. No one has, has accomplished what they said they were going to do, including Canada. So we're in big, big trouble climate wise. So this can't go on forever. And this rejection of God by billions of people just now, let alone the millions and millions and perhaps billions in the history of the world, we, we just we just can't go on like this forever. So Jesus comes finally and wipes out all the unbelievers. That starts a thousand year millennial reign. It's being ushered in where God sets up his kingdom on Mount Zion and Israel, uh, Satan is bound along with the false prophets and the, and the Antichrist and the beast out of the sea, beast out of the earth, all the rest of it. They're all done. All evil in the spirit realm is bound, okay? And so God now has a thousand years to fulfill all the promises that he, was, that he gave to Israel in the Old Testament, but was unable to fulfill because of their relentless rejection of him and worshiping other gods. So in our chapter 17 and 18, an angel comes down for the next three chapters, actually two different angels, and, and for the next three chapters, or two and a half, 17, 18, the beginning of 19, reflects, laments, and rejoices over the rise and fall of this uh, seemingly Satan's kingdom on earth, Babylon. But it also has hints of Israel because of their relentless rejection, ultimately the rejection of Jesus as Messiah, by the way. So we've heard the lament, God's heart, and isn't that amazing, at the end of this age, God's heart is, I'm lamenting. How did it how did it ever come to this? And then we heard the warning right after that. Come out of Babylon. Don't be part of this kingdom. So again, God's heart, like this is not what he, he, he wants to embrace. He's standing at the end of the road for the prodigal to come home. In chapter 18, we've heard two of a threefold woe explaining what we are to come out of. So this woe to you, Babylon, fallen Babylon. Um, we've heard from the king. That was the, the kings who, um, they've lost their, their kingdoms. They've lost all the luxuries that this Babylon would give them because Babylon is now burning off in the distance. And then we heard the woes from the, uh, from the merchants uh, that they now have nothing to sell because Babylon, the hub of all the luxuries of the world, is burning off in the distance. So now, this evening, we get to go to the third woe. Now, though our text is from uh, verses 19 to 24, I'm going to I'm going to go back two more two verses to 17 just for context. We already looked at them as far as a study last lesson, but this time, just for context, we're going to go from 17 to 24, but we will be studying 19 to 24, right? Let's pray. God, as we, as we read aloud the prophecies of this book, I pray that you would bless us, that you would teach us to take it to heart. And Lord, we say, come quickly, Jesus, bring us, take us home. We're ready, Lord, we're ready. And, and, and start to unfold all of these events. If it's now, we're ready. If it's later, God, we will persevere to the end, to the end of our days. So God, 
bless your word and may it come alive in every room that's represented here online either live or watching this later or in Tecumseh Park <laughs> Lord I pray that you would just that your word would just come alive and rise in our hearts and we'd have understanding even beyond our minds by the Holy Spirit pray in your name amen all right Revelation chapter 18, starting at verse 17. Yeah, second line of, of 17. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? They'll throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on, on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets. For God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you, the finality of Babylon's doom. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, With such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpets, trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's important people. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people, of all who had been slaughtered on the earth. All right. Verse 19, they will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out. So Babylon is burning. They're standing afar off. They don't want, they don't want any part of her or her destruction. All the sea captains react. And since this is the post bulls of wrath, remember they all have boils from head to toe, all the water, both fresh and salt, has turned to blood. Remember those? The sun is burning their skin. Yet in the midst of their pain, the loss of their luxuries, <laughs> it overwhelms them. They're, they're so that magic spell. They're, they're so we'll get to that, what magic spell we're talking about, or the, the, our text is talking about. So that dust on their heads. It may soothe the boils. It may be part of the soot from the fire. So even part of Babylon, they're throwing on their heads. But it's a sign of mourning. That's a biblical sign of mourning. Sackcloth and ashes. They say this, Woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through this wealth. So this is the third woe, as I already mentioned. And notice the woes are not spoken by God or by heaven or by angels. They're spoken by the unbelievers, those who rejected God. Woe number one, spoken by the kings who inflicted the damage on Babylon. Woe number two, spoken by the merchants that were selling the luxuries of Babylon, provided by Babylon. And woe number three, spoken by the sea captains, both import and exporting, importing and exporting the luxuries. All were mourning over the personal loss they would experience by the destruction of the provider of luxuries, this Babylon. But none would miss the city itself. They became rich through her wealth. See, the first century reader would go, um, what, what, what does this mean? The boats that go across uh, you know, Cyprus and in the Mediterranean, they're, they're, uh, they became rich through her wealth. But first century reader, or sorry, but presently, shipping is a huge industry, especially during the pandemic. It went through the roof. Uh, we noticed, we noted in our teaching uh, in another lesson that ships have doubled in size in the last 20 years. And 90% of everything that you own was shipped here. So look around your room. 90% of what you own was shipped here, either through raw materials or the actual product. 
So the pandemic, when stores were shut down and online shopping, which requires shipping, was, was the only way to purchase something. And so shipping now, even more than the last time I taught this, is through the roof. That's, that's what the scarcity and, and the prices are. Ships are lined up at ports because they can't get in because of all the stuff that's being, being shipped. That would have eluded the first century reader, but our shipping yards, man, they're making bank. And because of, part of me, and I mentioned this in the comments after the, the teaching last week, but it wouldn't surprise me if Babylon is actually the internet. You know, you have all the cities represented, all the nations are represented in the internet. And then someone mentioned, maybe it's just electricity itself. If electricity went down right now, worldwide, if it burned up, everybody would be lamenting. Everybody would lose their shirt. Think about that. Anyway, we'll see. But this gives us insight into the devastation of that second trumpet. So there were seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls of wrath in the Great Tribulation. The second trumpet, which all... all 21 of those, 777, seven, seven, they all un unleashed an event of the tribulation. The second trumpet was this. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. And that was a warning shot. Remember, the trumpets were a warning. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin in one hour, has now been used in all three woes, verse 10, 17, and 19 of our 18th chapter. We already noted that it was used in chapter 16 as well. The ten kings on the scarlet beast would wage war against the lamb and only reign for one hour, because he was going to, because because the lamb is the king of kings and the lord of lords. I love the way that phrase is. Now. Our text here in chapter 18, there's no sign of the lamb, but Babylon is destroyed in one hour. That being the case, we see them alive after the battle, it seems, to mourn over Babylon's destruction. This seems to be a mocking statement that it'll take the same amount of time for Jesus to defeat all those kings as it took for them to destroy Babylon. And how stupid to destroy Babylon, which is where you got your bread and butter from, but they're the ones that destroy them. I wonder if they did it by accident. Pulled the plug on the internet by accident. Sorry, I'll stop harping on that. Verse 20. Rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets, for God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. So notice the double quotes in the paragraph above. Verse 19, uh, the paragraph above was spoken by the sea captains, as quoted by the angel. But here, it's the angel who was, who was introduced in verse 1, there, he, he now is saying that, that verse 20, rejoice over her, um, you have it, sorry, 19, yeah, 20. So rejoice, the heavens, heavens rejoice, the spirit realm, including the angels, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, the Godhead, and redeemed humans. We saw all that in uh, chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation. So here's who's rejoicing, the people of God. Now that... That could be two different people. The Old Testament Israel, first used when God initially made his covenant with Israel. Exodus 6. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the, the from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So he calls him my people, people of God. And then the New Testament Christians used to describe believers of the new covenant in Jesus. Hebrews 4. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Apostles and prophets are to rejoice as well. The prophets may refer to the Old Testament prophet, who prophets who foretold the coming of the Messiah. And the apostles were the leaders of the early church. Okay, so there you have the prophets and the apostles. It reminded me of Jesus' words. What just days before he went to the cross. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets 
and stone those sent to you, how often I long to gather your children. Together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Doesn't that sound familiar? And they're rejoicing because of what Babylon inflicted upon them. Right? That's that's uh for God has judged her. It's the end of 20. For God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. So it's it's almost as if <clears throat> this is this is the payback. Jesus continued on with that. Because it sounds like revenge, but it sounds as look, your house has left you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is a prophetic word of the second coming of Jesus. So as he's talking about how they killed the prophets, this verse 20, Revelation 19, verse 20, is the response to what Jesus was saying. And because he says, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, he's referring to this event 2,000 years earlier. That foretold moment is the second coming. Jerusalem will not see or recognize Jesus as the Messiah because they, they see him. He rises from the dead, right? He dies, rises from the dead, appears to hundreds of people, and then ascends in heaven. So he he's saying to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, you won't recognize me until you see me in the second coming. You see how Jesus said that in Matthew 23? Love that. You know, he's not trying to be cryptic. It's just, how would the disciples have ever put that together? <laughs> anyway, the two, oh yeah, and so th this is how they'll recognize Jesus as the Messiah in our context in Revelation, the second coming. He's, God's given them the two witnesses, most likely Elijah and Moses, the 144,000 witnesses, the rapture, watching prophecy, prophesied end time events fulfilled, will all add to the awakening of Israel so that they will see Jesus at the second coming. Verse 20 continues, For God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. If this is talking about Israel, the judgment is cause for rejoicing. This reinforces the fire upon the city is not death, but cleansing. And it says Babylon has fallen. It never does say it's it's. Well, I guess it does. I'm just reading now. The great city of Babylon would be thrown down, never to be found again. So, <clears throat> but I think the we have this we have this that it could be this Babylon in chapter 17 seems to be Israel, but it's also Satan's kingdom. So it's a condition. So the fire for that Israel part of Babylon, I believe, is a cleansing, and then the satan's kingdom or unbelieving nations that is that is the uh that's the fire of judgment okay the deception of luxuries is the judgment she imposed on every city in the world who coveted what she could provide for them that fire was death the killing of the prophets the old people of god persecuting the new people of God, but this fire, that, this fire is cleansing for Israel. Okay. In most of our Bibles, we'd have the title over our text, over chapter 21, the finality of Babylon's doom. Verse 21, Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone, millstone and threw it into the sea. Now remember, the sea is blood at this point. That was one of the bulls of wrath. So this large millstone would create a bloody mess, you know, not using the vernacular, a, a mess of blood. The angel picks up a boulder. So the boulder's from the earth, okay? Part of the woe, verse 22, mentions the sound of a millstone will never be heard again. The description of the boulder being the size of the millstone is symbolic of the earth turning against the earth, right? And the splash of this boulder would be the last sound of any millstone ever. Verse 21. And the angel said, 
with such violence, the great city of Babylon would be thrown down, never be found again. And of course, the boulder will sink and never be seen again, especially in blood. So unless useless at the bottom of the sea, never, strong language, it never indicates the final moment of the great city is destruction. So the next few lines, this is really interesting. So stick with me on this one. The next few lines of this, and it's almost a poetic work, isn't it? That God would, he's so creative. He, he's, he's so, here he is, has this angel quoting poetry that, that he's written at the end of, of the age. So the next few lines describes the luxuries of the great city Babylon. Watch this. Starts with this. The music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters, will never be heard in you again. This represents the entertainment industry, doesn't it? Music, movies, TV, plays, concerts. Today, music is everywhere. The global mu music industry has grown from 1.4 trillion in 2011 to 2.2 trillion dollars by, or in, currently in 2021. This does not include the sport industry, social media industry, news industry, cell phone app industry, or the internet usage. So it's a distraction. Now remember, this; these lists are saying this is how Babylon destroyed the other cities, made them prostitute themselves away from God. So... This is, this is a distraction. We don't like silence, do we? Which affects our ability to, to think deeply or in, a spirit, in spiritual terms. And I'm really thinking a lot about this because I realized just in the last couple of weeks that I had, I had lost my ability to be still. I'd given up my ability to be still. And so the last couple of days, I've been trying to find moments to just be still, Psalm 46, be still and know that he is God. And, I, and I'm finding it very difficult. And it's because there's, there's noise, 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 the entertainment industry. And that's what this beginning of verse 22 is talking about. Even the Christian in entertainment industry. I, I'm not sure how I feel about worship music. Uh, I'm not on a bandwagon or anything, but just, just think about this. Worship music being played as background music. It just doesn't seem... If you're going to worship, worship. Um, and I know some people use it as background music to change the atmosphere. But I, I, I'm not sure if... I'm not... I don't know. Just food for thought. So, entertainment industry, a distraction. All that to say. Here's the next list in verse 22. No worker of any trade will be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. Again, the first century reader may not think uh, this is a big loss. Okay, all, all, the, all the trades are done. Okay, we'll just go back to farming. However, the Industrial Revolution, revolution in the 1800s would bring steam power, fossil fuels, electricity, printing presses, mass production methods, and then robotics, computer microprocessors, and more, and more, and more, and more. So the distraction, once again, the, the trades, bigger and better, faster and more efficient, drives out our nature of toil. Right? God created us to work, but then when we got kicked out of the garden, he said, now you will toil after everything, which is work with anxiety, and gives us a purpose that supersedes simply Walking with God. Is your job distracting you from walking with God? That's what this is saying. No worker of any trade. The, these are the things, this is the list of things that Babylon used, Satan's kingdom used to distract people from God. Verse 23. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. Light represents the elimination of darkness. Here, darkness will be endless. Remember the bowls of wrath. There's no sun, there's no moon, there's no stars. It's darkness. In contrast, the fire of Babylon is, is lighting up the planet. 
And that glowing angel, remember he came down, he's glowing, brilliant, he's lighting up the earth. Light also represents God's presence or influence over the earth. Remember Revelation 1, the lampstands or the churches, and they're forever lit because they hold the light. Here the ungodly lamps are eternally snuffed out. So this is a physical light. Your ungodly lamps are snuffed out. You're done. That also speaks of electricity, doesn't it? Just to go back to the old internet electricity theory. Verse 23. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. This may represent the distraction of natural human pursuits. I'm gonna make a home for myself. Gotta get married, gotta have kids, gonna have grandkids. And and we gotta have our traditions and we gotta have our Christmas thing we got to have our our you know birthdays and 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 these listen to me these are all bonuses of life to the number one pursuit and that's god revelation 4 11 for god's pleasure you were created you were created here the primary purpose is to walk with him and this to me is saying families if you put them as number one can distract you from walking with God. Remember, remember Jesus in Matthew 24 gave a warning of end times as it is as it was in the days of Noah. So it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Is your family distracting you? Relationships distracting you from walking with God? goes on. Verse 23, your merchants were the world's important people. Once again, first century readers would go, are you serious? Those people in the marketplace that are that are trying to get another, an extra denarii out of me? I mean, they're not the most important people on the planet at this point. But the revelation 2,000 years later makes more sense. You know, they the first century, they'd be going, you mean the farmers aren't the most important people? Who do you think is providing the stuff for the merchants? Not the builders of the buildings buildings and and uh, the synagogues? and everything. What about the philosophers that sat at the city gate and did nothing but talk about the deep things of, of, the, of life? <laughs> they were seen as the most important people. Politicians were seen as pretty important people. The army was seen as pretty important. Merchants? Squabbling in the marketplace? No, I don't think so. But today... Farmers are replaced with GPS-guided machinery, growth chemicals, robotics, and processed foods. Builders and craftsmen are replaced with machinery, prefabricated materials, just to name a few. The richest among us are those who work with commerce. Banks, mutual funds, stock markets, currency, bank fees, etc. And telecommunications, computers, data, cable, uh, cable TV, online movies, Netflix, Apple, <laughs> Apple TV, social media, internet use, apps. These have become, these merchants, the retail stores, storefronts, grocery stores, malls, online, Amazon, Kijiji, eBay, and moving more from storefronts actually to online merchants. If they have become the most important people in the world, haven't they? If they shut down, lose their ability to sell, we're sunk. We're all sunk. Some of you can't grow a tomato plant in your backyard. <laughs> oh, boy. <clears throat> or knit yourself a sweater. You see what I'm getting at. And so the merchants become more important than seek first the kingdom of God. All these other things will be added unto you. That God is your provider. It's, it's an illusion, isn't it? Verse 23. Here's, here's, here's the summary. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. Now, false, false signs and wonders will be part of the end times. Right? You're going to have false prophets 
you're going to have antichrists and 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 uh there's going to be lots of fake resurrections and things like that however babylon has never been guilty of of those at least it hasn't been mentioned in the discourse from chapter 17 and 18. so i believe that the list that we just put together the uh all, all of like this, this whole list of, um, I know it's here in, uh, yeah, entertainment, industry, so entertainment, your job, families, and commerce, it's all added up to one big illusion, the magic art, and it's distracted the nations from simply walking with God. Because none of those are evil on their own but only when they distract you from your primary objective to walk with God. Revelation 9, we saw, nor did they repent of the murders, their magic arts, their sexual, sexual, sexual immorality, or their thefts. So something that will create an illusion that will trick people into pursuing more and more of it. Let's, let's, have, let's have more entertainment, let's have more industry, let's work, work, work. Canada is one of the most driven countries in the world, by the way. You know, let's let's you know, family family first, and then the and the and the commerce is buying more and more and more. We're hoarders, and that's all one big illusion. Verse twenty four, and with this we look at a prophetic word and then sum this up. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people, of all who had been slaughtered on the earth. Blood indicates death. Somehow Babylon is responsible for the death of the prophets, God's holy people, and, did you catch this in the text? All who have been slaughtered on the earth. It reinforces the interruptions throughout Revelation that says, God, you're just in what you are doing. Everybody's saying, why isn't God doing anything? Why would God allow this? Why would God allow that? Well, guess what? All of a sudden, he does something about it, and everybody's going, oh, God looks so mean, People. Once again, this picture of Babylon the prostitute can be found in a prophetic word. I love rightly dividing the word in these in Jeremiah. Listen to God's heart, preferring reconciliation, but forced to judge. In the 25th chapter of Jeremiah, and though the Lord has sent all his servants, the prophets, to you again and again, you've not listened or paid attention. They said, Now turn each of you from your evil ways and your evil practices. And you can stay in the land the Lord gave to you and your ancestors forever and ever. Do not follow other gods to serve and worship them. Don't arouse my anger with what your hands have made. Then I won't harm you. But you didn't listen to me, declares the Lord. And you've aroused my anger with what your hands have made and you've brought harm to yourselves. Therefore, the Lord God Almighty says this, because you haven't listened to my words, I'll summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord, and I'll bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. I will banish from them the sounds of joy and gladness, the voice of bride and bridegroom, the sound of millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I'll punish the king of Babylon and his nation and the land of the Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord, and I'll make it desolate forever. I'll bring on that land all the things I've spoken against it, all that are written in this book and prophesied by Jeremiah against all the nations. They themselves will be enslaved by many nations and great kings. I'll repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. So this is referring to Babylon taking Israel captive for 70 years back in around AD circa 5, 600 BC. Okay. I think it's 589 to 6. I don't know. It's around there. So, so take that history and then our current text, which is our future. Israel disobeys God 
God raises up Babylon to rebuke Israel. God rebukes Babylon. Israel becomes like Babylon. God rebukes Babylon, the prostitute, and now that they're intermingled. He rescues Israel because they are the promised, they are the promised, sorry, they are the chosen people, but destroys all the Gentile unbelievers. Do not arouse my anger with what your hands have made. Every city has literally every square inch manipulated by man. Go to Toronto. Go to downtown Chatham. There's not one tree or plant that God put there. The entire, every city that you go to has been manipulated, the concrete jungles. And, and that's not bad in itself. But when it, when it, be, when it distracts you from walking with God and everything that comes with the city. So since all creation declares that there is a God, only when you look up in a city will you be able to say, oh, there you are, Lord. <laughs> but these are the warnings of Revelation, aren't they? Warnings that have only become clear in this generation. More than ever before. Seven times in, did Jesus say, in his warnings, rebukes and warnings, promises and commendations in to the seven churches in chapters two and three, seven times did he say, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near.